Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. I just got back from a family vacation. We went over to Washington State to visit my parents for the holidays. And every time that I come back from a trip like that, I like to do a quick recap video. So that's what we're gonna cover here today. Now, mostly in this video, I wanna talk about the handheld I brought with me, which is the AYN Odin 2. It just so happens that I've had this device for about three months at this point, And so it's a good time to do a recap of my previous review and then any sort of update that I found since then. So in this video, I want to talk about why I brought the Odin 2 and when I actually had a chance to play it while on vacation, and then also what games I played and what changes have happened with the Odin 2 since my last review. And so without any further delay, let's go ahead and jump right in. Okay, to start, let's talk about why I brought the Odin 2. And as you can imagine, I have like a million of these handhelds. And so this is always a big decision when I go on a trip like this. And it's funny, but the reason why I picked the Odin 2 has less to do with the device itself, but the other devices I chose not to bring. For example, I thought about bringing the Steam Deck OLED. It's got a nice big display and good battery life, but it's a little bit big of a handheld. And I've taken it on other trips before, and it's kind of hard to be inconspicuous when you're traveling with a big device like that. And so I really wasn't looking forward to pulling out a device that's about the size of a small child out of my backpack. And so that was one of the reasons why I decided not to go with the Steam Deck OLED. Now, another device I considered bringing is the ROG Ally, but the thing that held me back about that one is the battery life. I was gonna be on a flight from Hawaii to Washington, which is about six, seven hours, and I knew the battery life wasn't gonna last that long. And so as a result, I did kind of gravitate towards something that had better battery life, and that's why I chose the Odin 2. And I think for my particular use case, it's a perfect fit. It has a six inch screen, which is still nice and impressive, but it's a more compact design. It's about the size of a Nintendo Switch. In addition, the battery life is great. You can average about 10 hours of battery life. And so as a result, this just became my de facto device when it came to traveling. Now it's a long story, but I also have two Odin 2s right now. So I had to make a decision about that. I have the transparent blue model as well as the white unit. One of these is a review unit. The other one I bought myself. And after using both devices for a while, I've decided to go with the white Odin 2 over the blue one. I think the blue one really pops and it looks good, but the RGB lights is what's holding me back. On the blue model, the RGB lights around the analog sticks just look a little bit weird just based on their layout. And so what I've been doing with this model is turning off the lights around the analog sticks and only leaving them on the sides of the device. And I do think that looks pretty good, but honestly, I like the lighting around the analog sticks on the white model that much better. And I also really like that clean look that comes from the white model too. So that's the one I'm going to be sticking with. And finally, the other thing we're talking about in this section are the accessories I brought with me. And really, there wasn't much. I had a charging cable and then this soft case from TomTalk. And this is actually made for a Nintendo Switch. I think it costs about $30 and I think it works really well. It has a lot of padding on the inside. In fact, there is a cartridge holder within it that you can use for additional padding. And there's a little pocket here where I put a microfiber cloth. And really that's about it. It's a very simple case. There is a pocket on the outside as well to put your charging cable and that's really all I needed. So now let's talk a little bit about when I actually played games while on this trip. As you can imagine, it was a family vacation. So a lot of that time was spent with family, but there were some pockets of time here and there when I actually did play some games. And I'd say the easiest example is going to be while on the airplane. Like I mentioned before, we were flying across the Pacific, so we had like six or seven hours to kill each way to play games. And so I ended up sitting next to my oldest son, who's 14, and he actually brought my Steam Deck OLED. He played Elden Ring for a little bit, but gave up pretty quickly, and then just played Dave the Diver. He had a great time. And of course, while he was playing, I was playing the Odin 2. On the way over, I played a bunch of Chrono Trigger. We'll talk more about that later. And then on the way back, I played a bunch of Sea of Stars. It was a great time. And so that's probably where the majority of the game playing was right there, you know, about 12 to 14 hours of playing games while in the air. Now, another chunk where I had some time to play games was actually on a road trip. So my parents live in the Olympia area of Washington, but we made a trip over to Leavenworth, which is across the Cascade Mountains. It's about three hours each way. Now, thankfully, my dad was there to drive through the snow and all that stuff. I am not equipped for that anymore. I've been living in Hawaii forever at this point. And so that was nice. And then there were also some downtime there as well. As you can imagine, people were like falling asleep and whatnot on the road trip. And so I did sneak in a couple hours of gaming within that point as well. By the way, if you're ever in Washington during the holidays, I do recommend checking out Leavenworth. It's this little German or Bavarian town, and they've got like everything you can think of, all these great sausages and drinks and everything else. And so it's just a really cozy kind of feeling right there in the middle of Washington state. Anyway, other than that, I didn't really spend a lot of time playing games, just a few minutes here and there. You know, there were times when maybe someone would take a nap and everything was quiet in the house. And so I'd knock out maybe an hour of Chrono Trigger or Sea of Stars, and really that was about it. But to be honest, given the fact that I spend so much time reviewing all these 
various devices, it was nice to just focus on one and only play it like kind of leisurely. And so that was a really great experience for me. And of course, all those factors that make the Odin 2 so great really came into play during this use case. So for example, if I just needed to switch it off for a little bit, I could press the power button to put it into standby, and then I could come back to it, tap the power button again, and I'd be right back in my game. In fact, one thing I noticed when I got back from my trip is that I had forgotten to turn off my other Odin 2, the transparent blue one. And so this was on standby for the entire two weeks I was gone. Now, I don't remember what the battery life was when I left, but when I came back, it was still at about half full. And so that's pretty incredible considering the fact that I was gone for two weeks. Either way, I found this device to be a perfect fit when it came to a family vacation like this. I could pick it up during my leisure time and just kind of play for a few minutes here and there. And it was always there ready and waiting for me. Now, before we jump into the games that I was playing during this trip, I do want to talk about some of the updates that have happened to this device since my last review and even my starter guide. So let's jump into those. Now to start, AYN has released some over-the-air updates for the device that you can find within their settings. Number one, they've improved the RAM utilization on the device, and this really comes into play with the 299 base model, which has 8 gigabytes of RAM. Additionally, within the Odin settings, they now have an option to use a 4 gigabyte VRAM swap. And again, this will be really good for the base model with its 8 gigabytes of RAM, specifically if you're trying to play Nintendo Switch games or some high-end Android games. Now, I don't have the base model to test with, but the reports I've been reading say that this 4 gigabyte swap file has been helping a lot when it comes to Nintendo Switch emulation. There's a couple games like Tears of the Kingdom that still aren't playing completely at full speed, but for the most part, most other games are playing just fine. So if you do have a base model, I would recommend checking out this 4 gigabyte VRAM swap. It might improve your performance. Another app I recently found that's been really helpful is one called Obtainium. And the great thing about this app is that it collects and organizes all your other third-party apps. And for a lot of emulators, it's better to actually download and install the most recent development versions. And so there are a lot of apps that will benefit from this, including Dolphin and Yuzu and Citra and even RetroArch. So you can get all these apps directly through Obtainium, and then it'll notify you when there's a new update, and you can update it directly within this app as well. So if you're like me and you want to stay on the cutting edge of the most recent releases for some of these emulators, I found that Obtainium is really helpful. And I've actually made a new section within my AYN Odin starter guide that talks about advanced emulator options, and that'll talk you through the whole Obtainium process. And I've got a couple other handy tips in there as well, including how to add custom texture packs for GameCube and PS2, and then also controller patches for Wii games like Super Mario Galaxy. Anyway, I'll leave this stuff linked down below if you want to learn more. Another handy feature I recently found is the ability to add a controller swap within the top menu in Android. So if you want to switch between the Xbox and Switch layout easily, you can do that using a third-party solution. Now, AYN is actually working on an update of their own to make this official, and so we should be seeing this in an OTA update soon. But if you want to try it out yourself, I'll also leave that linked in my starter guide. And finally, the other big update I wanted to touch on is Nintendo Switch emulation using the Yuzu emulator. This one has had a bunch of updates over the past few weeks, and some of these are very significant significant. Probably the most important one is going to be under the advanced emulator settings. Now under the debug section, they have a new CPU backend option called Native Code Execution or NCE. And with the more recent versions of Yuzu, this has actually been turned on by default. And this feature is pretty amazing. It allows the Nintendo Switch code to run directly on the CPU. And given the fact that the Nintendo Switch runs on the same sort of architecture as an Android device, this means we have a lot of efficiency gains. And using native code execution has improved things a lot. For example, many games that were crashing before are now playable, and a lot of these games are running a lot better with fewer stutters and everything else. Not only that, I found that the Odin 2 doesn't have to work as hard to play some of these games, which means that I'm going to have better battery life as well. And not only that, I've been able to play a lot of these games in docked mode, which means it's going to take up that full 1080p resolution and it looks ultra sharp on this display. A good example here is going to be Super Mario Wonder. Previously I had to play this in handheld mode and it looked a little bit fuzzy but was still very playable, but now I can play it in docked mode just using the standard performance profile and I'm getting very few stutters as well, so this has been a really great experience. And so if you are running Nintendo Switch emulation on the Odin 2, I would recommend updating to the latest version of Yuzu and you can also use that Obtainium app to make it even easier. Another thing they've added to Yuzu are per game configuration settings. And this has been really great for me as well. For for example, if there's a certain game that runs better in docked mode than in handheld mode, I can change that in the settings. And you can even choose which drivers to use with certain games. So this really opens up things when it comes to customizability within Yuzu. 
Anyway, those are all the big changes that I've noticed since my last review, and I'll leave all this stuff linked in my starter guide, which will be down below. Okay, next I want to talk about some of the games that I played and how I played through them, because I think it might be a little bit interesting. We're going to start with the number one game that I played the most, which was Chrono Trigger. And this is a game I've been trying to play for like 30 years at this point, but this trip just seemed to be the perfect time to actually do it. Now, there are a bunch of different versions of this game, Super Nintendo, PS1, DS, as well as a PC port, and so I did take some time to deciding which one I wanted to use. And the advice I got was to try the Nintendo DS version. This one has the cutscenes that are featured in the PlayStation 1 version, but it doesn't have those long loading times that were there in the PlayStation version of the game. And so it was nice to see these cutscenes from time to time as I was playing through the game, which took me about 20 hours altogether. Now another thing I had to decide was how I was going to emulate this game on Nintendo DS. The standard emulator that everyone uses is drastic, and that's the one I generally recommend, but I found that when playing the game, even with the high resolution turned on, everything looked just a little bit fuzzier than I was expecting. So I ended up playing this through the Melon DS emulator core in RetroArch instead. Now this is not a very efficient core, but the Odin has more than enough power for it, and in addition this is a pixel-based game, so it's not rendering 3D graphics. So as a result, the performance was just great on the Odin, using RetroArch, and the picture was nice and sharp and clear. In addition, I was able to use RetroArch shaders, so I used an LCD grid overlay, just a really light one, but it looked very nice. And by virtue of using it through RetroArch, I had access to all these universal hotkeys, including loading and saving states, and also the fast forward button, which came in really handy when I was trying to play certain battles. The only other thing worth mentioning is that I did play with a few cheats. For example, I used a cheat that gave me four times the experience every time I finished a battle. This allowed me to level up more quickly and made it a lot easier to get through the game. That's one of the reasons why I never finished it in the first place because often I would get a couple hours into it and it would just be a grind. And for me, I'm more interested in the story than the gameplay, so I found this to be a perfect balance for my gameplay style. Either way, yeah, I had a great time playing through this game and I highly recommend it, and it still holds up here 29 years later. Now another game I've been wanting to replay is the original Metal Gear Solid. Initially I thought I would play it on the PS1, but because the Odin 2 is so powerful, I can play it on the GameCube, even upscaled to 1080p, and so that's what I did. And it's been a long time since I played through this game. I think I played through Metal Gear Solid Twin Snakes on the GameCube maybe back in like 2004, 2005. So it's been a good, what, almost 20 years at this point. And so I've really enjoyed going back through that story because honestly, I've forgotten a lot of the plot points. In addition, the game looks incredible on the Odin because I'm upscaling those graphics so everything looks nice and crisp. And so I've also been really enjoying this experience too. Now I'm probably only about a third of the way through it. I'm actually right before the Psycho Mantis fight. I'm not sure how I'm going to get through that. I know I have to fiddle around with the controls, but all the same, I'm looking forward to that battle as well. Another thing that kind of struck me about this game is how cutscene intensive it is. I didn't really realize how much time you spend watching the game instead of playing. I knew that was definitely a thing that happens in Metal Gear Solid 2 and beyond, but I just wasn't expecting it with the first game as well. And by no means am I complaining about it. I really like that cinematic experience of Metal Gear Solid. In fact, it's kind of amazing how advanced this game was at the time when it comes to just having a very blockbuster feel to it. Now, another game I spent a lot of time playing was Sea of Stars. In fact, this was one of the reasons why I consider bringing the Steam Deck OLED as well as the ROG Ally, because I wanted to play the PC version of that game. But then I remembered I have the Switch version of the game already, and so I could just emulate it on the Odin 2 instead. And given the fact that we've had a bunch of updates to Yuzu, it actually is a really great fit on this handheld. Number one, the game runs using that native code execution and also plays in docked mode, which means it's going to be a full 1080p resolution. And the game is also not very power hungry, so I got some really great battery life, about 8 hours on average when playing the game. And given the fact that I had just beaten Chrono Trigger, this was a really great segue, because it's a very similar game in many respects, and so it was nice to see a modern implementation of some of those aspects that I really enjoyed in Chrono Trigger. And another thing I liked about the game is that you can tweak some of the gameplay mechanics. After you've gotten through the first part of the game, they give you these things called relics. And these are optional tweaks that you can use and you can collect more later on. And again, because I focus more on story than gameplay, I really enjoyed having that balance. In fact, there's one relic that's really helpful, it'll double your hit points, and then also every time you finish a battle, your hit points will go back to 100%. And so that's been great for me because I spend less time doing inventory management and just getting through the game instead. And so if you're looking for a more traditional role-playing game on a modern console, I think that Sea of Stars is great, both on Nintendo Switch or the PC version. And I'm about three or four hours into it at this point, and I am hooked. I can't wait to finish this game as well. Now overall, I had a great experience when playing Odin 2 on this trip, but there were a couple drawbacks that I wanted to mention in this next section. And the first one here is really 
really just an effect of using emulation instead of playing on original hardware. Like I mentioned before, I wanted to play the PC version of Sea of Stars on the Steam Deck OLED or the ROG Ally. And the reason for that was because I already have a cloud save game going on those devices. And so I knew I could just jump right back into the game and then start from there. And unfortunately, when moving over to Switch emulation, I had to start over from scratch. Now, honestly, that's not really a bad thing. It just means that I probably need to finish the game on my Odin 2, but that's definitely not as handy and convenient as it is when using Steam Cloud Saves. Another thing that was a bit of a drawback was the fact that when I was playing Chrono Trigger, I would only earn retro achievements when I was actually online. And that's because this feature does require you to be connected to Wi-Fi as you're playing. And as you can imagine, I was on an airplane a lot of the times I was playing this game. And so as a result, there's a big chunk in the middle of my retro achievements points where I didn't earn anything. I've got a bunch in the beginning and then a bunch in the end. And again, this is really just kind of a nitpick, but man, the completionist in me makes me want to play through that game again. And then finally, the only other drawback that I noticed when I was playing the Odin 2 has to do with the D-pad. Now, this is an analog-centric device, and the fact that the analog stick is above the D-pad. And I did find that with many games that would use either an analog stick or a D-pad, I preferred the analog stick, just because the positioning was that much more comfortable. And so as a result, games like Chrono Trigger, I didn't use the D-pad at all, maybe to go through the menus, but that was about it. So again, it was just a little thing, but I did find that I I prefer to use analog controls when playing with the Odin 2, even if I could use the D-pad instead. So really that's about it in a nutshell when it comes to my trip over the past couple weeks, specifically when it came to playing the Odin 2, and I had a great time with it. And I made a couple review videos about the Odin 2, and I was saying at the time that it's the best device you can buy at that price point, and I think it's even better now. Now that I spent more time with it, I love it even more. However, that being said, the price point is pretty high, so if you haven't watched my other review videos, I really break down that price point, especially when it compares to other devices like the Steam Deck. But really when it comes down to it, my advice is the same that I had back then. And that is that if you don't mind having the black model, I think the base model at $299 is a really great deal. And given the fact that we have that new VRAM swap capability, I'm not really sure it's going to be worth investing another $70 to get the Pro model. Instead, I think the only reason to get the Pro model is going to be if you prefer to have a different colorway over the black one. For me, it's an easy choice because I don't really like black handhelds. I would prefer to have something white or transparent blue like I have. However, I would say at this point, because the performance is pretty similar, it's really going to be a cosmetic choice more than anything. The Pro model also has more internal storage, but you can always get a bigger microSD card. And honestly, I don't think there's any reason to get the Max model unless you really want a bunch of internal storage. I think it's just kind of overkill to have 16 gigabytes of RAM. And also bear in mind, this device is definitely an investment. It's $299 for the base model and $370 for the Pro one. And at that price point, you're very close to a Steam Deck. Again, I would reference back to that review video I made initially. And so it's really going to be up to you and what type of games you're trying to play. But for me in particular, having something that's a little bit smaller with better battery life and the ability to emulate all the way up to PS2 and GameCube and Nintendo Switch is pretty great. Hello, this is tomorrow slash editing slash new haircut Russ. I'm fighting off a cold right now, so I'm going to attribute this to having brain fog. But in all this discussion about the Odin 2 and the price being pretty close to the Steam Deck, I forgot to talk about the other side of the spectrum in the fact that there are some pretty decent devices that are going to be a little bit cheaper that might get you pretty close to the Odin 2 as well. And the device I'm specifically talking about is the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro. In fact, I already did a preview video about it. I'll leave it linked down below. But I'm actually getting my review unit later today. And so that'll be the next video I make as a review on this device. Now, this one is going to retail for $199. So that's quite a bit cheaper than the Odin 2, but it has a Dimensity 1100 chipset, and I've never really used that chipset before, but my suspicion is that it will play GameCube and PS2 really well. So if you are looking for a smaller, more compact device, and you don't want to spend those Steam Deck prices to get the Odin 2, then the Retro Pocket 4 Pro might be one to watch for. So check out that video when I release it later on this week or this weekend. Anyway, I just wanted to throw that little segment in there talking about the Retro Pocket 4 Pro because I do think it's worth having in the conversation. So let's go back to the rest of the video. So I guess when it comes down to it, when I first reviewed the Odin 2, I was in love with it. And after spending two weeks straight using it as my only handheld, I've only grown to love it even more. So let me know what you think in the comments down below. Did you end up picking up an Odin 2 and how are you enjoying it? Or if you didn't pick it up, I'd be interested to hear why you decided not to get it. As always, thank you for watching and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.